Hey guys, it's another awesome chat and we're uh, gearing up for PodCamp Pittsburgh. I got my shirt on and we're going to be talking big time PodCamp with uh, Justin Kanaki. But first, please go check out awesomecast.net for all the great uh, interviews we've, do- we're, we've been doing uh, over the past couple of months. And of course, the Awesome Cast itself. A lot of great tech talk, geek talk, and we might... It was, there's always a show we might be starting. You, we're, there's there's just too many people with too many ideas. So stay tuned for that. Uh, awesomecast.net. And please learn how to subscribe over there to this and uh, other fine, fine, awesome podcasts. So with me, as I mentioned briefly there, Justin Kanaki joins us. He's a good longtime friend in the business. How you doing from Baltimore, Maryland? Uh, I'm doing good, Mike Sorg. How are you doing over in Pittsburgh? Doing all right, doing all right. Uh, so uh, Justin is, of course, the uh, uh, co-founder officially, right, of PodCamp yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. There were several of us. Yes. <laughs> Many disappeared, but yes, there were several of us at the start. We are the ones that remain. So um, so I wanted to talk with you today about PodCamp Pittsburgh, what you've been up to uh, lately. Well, first, can we get a little background? For, who the heck is this Justin Kanaki guy, other than uh, something about PodCamp, right? What, what, what is it that, that, that you're known for uh, entirely? I ask myself that every day, Mike. Don't but, we all? Uh, don't we all? Especially in this line I mean, of work. History and it changes on a pretty regular basis, but uh, I guess the answer for today is um, I'm a freelance writer. I spent about uh, 15 years producing multimedia video content, uh, which turned somehow into online video, which turned somehow into online marketing, which at some point just turned into marketing. So uh, there was a weird winding road that led me to where I am right now, which is um, a freelance writer, I do some marketing. I do some freelance coaching for other freelancers who want to improve their business. Uh, and I do a lot of scripting for online video and interactive media. So I'm like a jack of all trades, master of none. That's what the internet gives us these days, right? Hey, and I think it, it, we should mention, like you, you mentioned it briefly, but you were uh, uh, the guy behind uh, one of the earliest for way, for, forays into what a lot of people do now, what the online video, would something be desired and eventually the baristas. This is true, yeah. So in uh, 2003, wow, uh, I started wow. Something to Be Desired. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Something to Be Desired was uh, an experiment at the time in serialized web content. And it turns out that uh, the actors I was producing it with enjoyed it, and we just kept doing it for fun. And eventually YouTube took off and uh, started front-paging us. So we got a good six years out of producing Something to Be Desired. At the time, it was the longest-running web series. I believe we've been tied by the Gill since then. But uh, we're in good company as far as I'm concerned there. And then we spun that off into the baristas that lasted one year. Uh, and then they sold the coffee shop we were filming in. So reality intruded on life, and that story came to an end for now. But you never know when it might come back. You never know. You never know. I was very fortunate to be a part of the baristas season uh, behind the scenes. And that was, that was a really, fu- really, really fun experience for me. You, were, you held it together, literally. Oh, that was me? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I deserve that much credit for that thing. You but. can take the credit and or the blame, whichever one you want. <laughs> it all comes together. Um, but I, actually, it's interesting because I found yours. I just got my letter. Did you get your letter today that Blip TV is uh, is officially shutting down? Because uh, I noticed that what I pulled up is hosted over there. <laughs> no kidding. Yes. That's a very valid point that I will need to work on improving upon. Huh. <laughs> so I don't know if you have it over YouTube. I think you got it on YouTube, don't you? But, uh, uh, we had some of it on YouTube, yeah. I think it's going to be time to upload all of it. Oh, no. Uh, actually, with funny aside, back in 2003, there really wasn't a YouTube. I think it was before MySpace was even popularized. Right. So uh, we had to build our own video distribution platform to distribute WMV files <laughs> oh, wow. way back when. And as soon as that was built, we found out that there were these other services like uh, iTunes and, and YouTube and so forth that we could actually make use of. So one of those cases where you build it and then somebody else comes and builds something even better right on top of it. And you're like, why do we spend all this time? That's how the Internet works. Yeah? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, certainly. Or it gets co-opted into uh, iTunes, right? So, uh, but All roads lead to iTunes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Whether, they, whether, they, uh, whether iTunes wants to admit it or not. Uh, but anyways, so, so this came around to, uh, you know, we actually, we, we met through work, actually. 
we did. We had a job uh, uh, together, uh, doing video things of a nature, and, uh, yeah. and and you went away and you came back with this whole pod camp idea. <laughs> At least that's how I remember it. It just like he, he went away and then there was pod camp. Can you fill in the blanks for me? How, how did pod camp Pittsburgh come up, come about for you? That sounds about right, actually. Okay. Um, so we have to flash back in time to 2006, which in my mind doesn't seem very long ago, but on the calendar, that's nine years ago. Jeez. Life flies. You know? um, but yeah, back in 2006, when the term podcasting was new and people weren't sure what it was yet, uh, there were some people who around the country who were producing audio and video content for the web that would be downloaded onto the iPod. Uh, and that's hence why it was called podcasting, and therefore we created PodCamp. Uh, I didn't create the original PodCamp, though. That was a couple guys up in Boston, Massachusetts, who came up with that idea. And they thought that there were only a few people online producing web content. Uh, they knew a lot of them were actually in the Boston area, I think, because there's a lot of high-tech um, education going on up there. So that was sort of one of the leading um, breeding grounds of people testing out this new space. So they said, hey, we're going to do this thing called PodCamp, which was built on the bar camp model, which if you're familiar with that is basically peer to peer education. There's no schedule for a bar camp. You just sort of show up and the people who are there decide what they want to teach that day and they throw it all up on the schedule and you go to the event you want to go to at the time you want to go to and learn from the person you want to learn from. So there's a very good chance you're going to have two great sessions scheduled at once. You have to make a choice and that's life. Uh, PodCamp was built on that model. But it was audio and video people teaching each other how to do audio and video for the web, which might not sound very interesting at all now that we're nine years removed from it. But back then, it was crazy because nobody else was even talking about this. So the people in Boston thought there'd be maybe a few dozen attendees to that event. And I believe they got over 400 for the original podcast. People came from Florida. They came down from Canada. They came from California. They came from New York. They came from London. Uh, it was kind of a big party. And as a result of that, at the end of the event, the founders said, oh, you know what? This idea really works. So instead of leaving it up to us to continue this, why don't those of you who enjoyed the event take it back to your hometown and you do a pod camp, whatever, pod camp New York, pod camp Los Angeles, whatever you want to do. So I, being from Pittsburgh at that time, said, well, yeah, I'd love to do that. And then I heard that the folks in Philadelphia who were at the event also wanted to do that. So when I came back to Pittsburgh, I gathered some friends together and I said, let's beat Philadelphia to the punch. And that's how PodCamp Pittsburgh came about six weeks after PodCamp Boston. Six weeks? <laughs> yeah. It, imagine these days, imagine hosting an event, starting from scratch and taking six weeks to do it. You, I wouldn't think it could be done. But nine years ago, I didn't know it couldn't be done. So we did it. Well, in complete homage to that, I think we, we did the exact same thing for PodCamp Pittsburgh 9 because it almost didn't happen and it got pulled together in six weeks. But at least yep. there was like there was a a a, a platform and a uh, you know a to do list that we had done previous years, and even, even a venue that we've been using for several years with the great uh, Pan Point Park uh, people. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, once you've been doing it, I think it's easier to do it faster and faster. But at the beginning, maybe the other thing that worked for us then was there were no expectations and there was no template, so it, there was nothing to compare it to. Yeah. Right. After you do the first one, then you have to keep topping it and keep topping it, and that's where the pressure comes in. But, I don't want topping uh, it. I just, I just like make sure it stopping happens. It's, <laughs> so it's, it's topping it and there's keeping it alive. Yeah, yes, either yeah. one, either one is good. Sometimes it's some years it's life support. Sometimes and there's a there's a uh, young Justin Kanaki with the Pittsburghers are tasty. There's a there's me as well. I just think I think I still have that hat, um, but. <laughs> But uh, yeah, this was at uh, Pittsburgh Filmmakers, a uh, great space that we only used one year, um, and then eventually our institute and, of course, Pit, uh, Point Park University. Uh, so, so rolling into that, how did the first pod camp go? I loved it on my end, at least. Yeah, you were an attendee at the first one. That's where I think... Uh, presenter uh, as I, well. I knew that you were a podcaster then. In fact, yeah. you're one of the first ones I ever met in real life. And I remember, <laughs> actually, I remember at our day job office, one of us brought in a USA Today article from the money section that talked about, is podcasting the new thing? Wow. I remember this. And, uh, and they reprinted and that, course, that same article like a year ago, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it seems, it's, it feels it's, like. Yeah, you know, and to step away from, from the, the podcast story itself for a second, I, 
you bring up a good point. Podcasting as a artistic experiment or a, God forbid, as a business seemed like it was viable back in 2006, like it might take off. And then for whatever reason, that whole po uh, podcasting concept seemed to fall away from popular uh, usage as the whole quote unquote social media, social marketing thing took over just nationwide, worldwide. It, it got to be a lot more about the social media channels and the blogging and so forth. And the actual creation of the media seemed to have gotten pushed by the wayside. And then it all became about video, which all went to YouTube. And mm -hmm. then somehow a couple of years ago, it got pushed back to audio. I don't know how, I don't know why. I think the uh, WNYC people have a lot to do with that. And some of the other big radio stations uh, putting their content out online rather than just across the airwaves almost created like the second wave of podcasting. And now you've got uh, shows like Serial that made it mainstream in a way that we aspiring you know, media creators 10 years ago didn't have the clout or the power to do then. So it's really weird, like it's the Lazarus of uh, media. It existed once, it went dormant, and now it's back. So I think in a way, I feel like the old man of media who is working in a suddenly new again realm. I don't know how you feel about that, because you've been doing this the whole time. I, I, I've been, yeah, but my head's been down in the trenches for uh, going on 10 years now, where I actually we were celebrating the 10th anniversary in January of Wrestling Mayhem show. We had, so you you did this in, thank you, uh, you did this in November, and I remember going into it, and we had started in January of that year. And, and again, I think it was, you know, same, you came in with this whole PodCamp idea, and uh, I, I it was my first, like, uh, I don't know if I, I remember... I asked, uh, I don't know if I should speak on this because I feel like I haven't been doing it that long. And uh, and you you had words that I still hold uh, to this day uh, along the lines of uh, you're always an expert in something. And uh, and uh, so so you always know. And I, I think I've reiterated that to I don't know how many people over the years, too. Uh, especially in context of, I mean, I should talk about this at PodCamp, but I'm not sure. It's just like, you're, you always know a little bit more than like that person that's going to walk in the room trying to learn something, right? And uh, yeah, I, I think we all take for granted what we know. We think everybody else knows it. And the truth is, it's amazing. Every time you try and give like an advanced talk at, at uh, an event like this, it almost always has to get kicked back a level to the basics because we overestimate how much other people haven't taken the steps we've already taken. Right. Right. Exactly. So, all right. So, so, so back to the, like pod camp one, you did filmmakers. Like how did the first event go? We thought it went really well. I mean, we didn't have any expectations again. So any number of attendees would have felt good from a, you know, like a, a validation standpoint or an ego stroking standpoint. Mm -hmm. But, uh, we had, I want to say about 120 or 130 attendees. Nice. Uh, and a lot of folks uh, back then came in from out of town as well. Uh, we had some folks who at the time were sort of luminaries in this space, like uh, Andrew Barron, who had founded Rocket Boom, which was one of the first successful video podcasts. Uh, and Brian Conley, who had done Alive in Baghdad, where he was actually over in uh, the Middle East handing out cameras to civilians on the ground and then uploading their footage as a citizen news organization. So these are people who didn't live in Pittsburgh at the time but they came to share what they knew with the Pittsburghers uh, at this event. Because again, back then, you, there weren't enough outlets for the people who wanted this information, so it was worth the time of the creators to take those trips. Uh, now, it seems like they're, it, and actually a couple of years after uh, PodCamp started, the whole concept got so successful, there were PodCamps all across the country, all across the world, it became much easier to get that information out and much easier to find a localized group rather than having to travel to find it. But that first one we thought went really well for 130 something people to show up at Pittsburgh Filmmakers on relatively short notice and feel comfortable sharing their expertise with each other. And I think what you and I both saw coming out of that was there is a community in Pittsburgh that grew up around the concept of making media in this democratic format. Mm -hmm. And then we turned what should have just basically been like a hobbyist's club into a really long lasting community. Like so many of us are still actual real life friends now as a result of having met through this event that it took on its own life, in my opinion, uh, that got a little bit bigger than just uh, technologists swapping, you know, compression stories uh, aspect. <laughs> to it. I don't remember that session. 
uh, myself, though. I, it was a, although I do recall a very good uh, green screen uh, session. I remember geeking out a little bit that first one that the great Alex Lindsay uh, joined us. Of course, I knew him from Tech TV, and of course, you know, big, you know, everybody knows him on Mac Break Weekly these days. Uh, uh, tech uh, this week in tech, um, mm-hmm. but I remember he was there and and, and and seeing some of the technologies he was talking about, like uh, a clickable, uh, you know, you can click on the clothes in, in quick time of what somebody's wearing. And now we have like Amazon Fire, or I was playing with my. Uh, Actually, no, it was my Google tablet, and I was watching something on Google video, and it would pop up all the music and all the actors and all that stuff, and it was context-sensitive. And I like I remember looking at that, and I'm like, this is like not precisely, but pretty much what he was talking about way back at PodCamp 1 in 2006, and it's completely here and and beyond that, even to that extent. Um, oh, yeah. But, uh, but you know, just the way the technology is going, but again, on the relationships, I, uh, that's... Uh, uh, Many times reiterated uh, on on Mac Break. Anytime I Justine comes up, uh, that that Alex had met her in that session for green screening, and uh, which is uh, you can say probably you know between that and iPhone Bill uh, a couple years later, uh, really kind of catapulted her to uh, to stardom. I guess now now she's doing I don't even know what these days. <laughs> she uh, so Justine or I Justine as we know her is doing very well for herself. She has a book. A, uh... She has a physical book. <laughs> Yeah, so let's talk real quickly about uh, the fact that we hold ourselves uh, as successes these days. We measure our success by how much old school media our new school media creators can make, right? Mm-hmm, That's true. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you're you're big on YouTube, but you're really big when you get a book in Barnes and Noble. But it's true. You know, uh, we still want to see our new creators celebrated through the old means. Can't, you're never going to be able to change that. It, it, it's, um, it still justifies them to a certain extent. Like my parents, I, I do all this stuff online, but my grandparents don't care. It's like, hey, I was on TV last week on the evening news. And they're like, oh, you're doing something with yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, it's all context. And if you, it, like our parents' generation, now this sounds very generalized, but generally speaking, our parents' generation doesn't necessarily have the same appreciation of how digital media can spread and the value of having an audience online where it might be hundreds or thousands or millions of people, most of whom are strangers. And to us, that may be gratifying, but to our parents, I then I think quite logically, they're like, well, you don't know these people, you know, they could all be robots. They could be dogs. We have no idea. Mm-hmm. So I, when you have a, uh, a Justine, who's got millions of YouTube viewers and subscribers, it, on one hand, well, yeah, that could be anybody. On the other hand, when she gets a few hundred thousand books in a Barnes and Noble, that's a tactile, tangible point of success. So I don't think that'll ever go away officially. Just mm. like it took radio to normalize podcasting a decade later, it, it takes did. books to normalize YouTubers in the eyes of you know the world at large. It did. It did. It, it is funny because I also remember a conversation from the first pod camp where it we, like something, some conversation, some session degenerated into a monetization discussion. And I don't know if I was just very hippie about podcasting at the time and it really turned me off. And then here I am 10 years later trying to figure out how to make money at this damn, damn thing, right? Um, it's interesting how that's come around, too, that it has become more or less a business for a lot of people. I mean, there's a million-dollar studio. Can it can be. Yeah. I think there's a million-dollar studio in Pataluma for This Week in Tech for, for guys like mm-hmm. that. that have, but again, that's somebody that's converted from TV, had a following to begin with. And, and had the know-how to do something like that. Um, but then you see that, you know, kind of push of the Kevin Smiths coming over, the Chris Hardwick's building their uh, media empire. And then again, going back to television with, with, with certain properties uh, with, with that. It, it's, really, it's really interesting how are we complementing it or are we still our own format at this point? Well, really what we're wading into is a discussion about co-opting the media or the expression of one group by another group Mm -hmm. because I mean, you mentioned Kevin Smith and you mentioned uh, Chris Hardwick, both of whom got their start in other forms of media, you know, uh, film, TV, stand-up comedy, where they were already, uh, you know, they had staying power. You know, they, they have the clout. You have a Will Wheaton who was already Will Wheaton before he ever turns on a microphone to do a podcast. Right. Right. So, when those kinds of folks start to say, oh, look what these people over here who no one knows are doing, we could do that too. Of course, it casts a much larger light on you know, those of us who are, uh, quote unquote, the smaller fish in the pond, and that's helpful. But it's, it, I think that's the way it's always going to be. Where you'll have your early adopters of any technology, and 
you're almost uh, too far ahead of the curve at that point. The general public doesn't know why they would want this new form of media. They don't know what's in it for them. You know, it looks weird. It looks different. Businesses don't want to pay you to produce it yet. They want to advertise on it. Who's watching it? You can't prove it. You can't tell. I remember all the battles trying to get uh, brands to invest in podcasts and web video back in the day. Mm-hmm. And now where is all of your, uh, your, your uh, advertising budgets going in most of your, uh, your companies is to online media, primarily to mobile, as a matter of fact. You know, you couldn't have predicted that 10 years ago. And if you did, they would have said, oh, sure, right, buddy. And then they would have pumped all the money back into TV and print. So you can see where the future is going. But it, I think it takes someone who's got a foot in both worlds to make that future a reality. So we owe a lot, I think, to the Will Wheatons and the Kevin Smiths and the Chris Hardwicks uh, for taking the time to justify this media in the eyes of the corporate benefactors, God bless them, right? (laughs) But I think we also owe a lot to those of us who've been in the trenches producing this work, whether it was making us money or not, because we prove that it's doable. We prove there's an audience for it. We prove that it doesn't just have to be part of the corporate machine. It can be a form of personal expression. And that, I think, is going to bring a lot more people into the creative aspect of it and uh, the appreciation of it, rather than people who are just approaching it as an audience to be marketed to. Wow. Not that I have anything against marketing. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's what it kind of boils down to. But I think there's still, I think the discussion a lot is like, you know, I think everybody has stars in their eyes a little bit when they start uh, their blog, their their everything, you know, because they hear about the people that you know are successful with this. You know, for every every Ginny Pitt girl, you know, there's somebody that's just you know a mom on their blog, and they have you know 15 people that that, that read, and and that's great, and they're they're interactive, and that's fine. You know, that's a, I think we need to be more appreciative of the fact that we even have 15 people at all responding right, to us right. when we're writing at that point. You know. Uh, I think the internet does a really weird flattening of expectations to an unscalable level. And what I mean right. by that is, you know, you look at an I Justine or you look at, uh, you know, uh, pretty much anybody on YouTube or anybody who has over 100,000 Twitter followers, and you think to yourself, I could do that. That seems easy. We're both using the same technology. We're both using the same means. Right. And as a result, I have every expectation of scaling what I'm doing up to their level and it should happen for me pretty easily because uh, if you're if you're not crippled by the self doubt of an artist, uh, <laughs> you you believe that everything that you're making is great and wonderful and should be seen by as many people as possible. And you go out there and you produce it, and all of a sudden it gets to 15 people. And instead of you thinking to yourself, "That's great, 15 people like what I'm doing. How can mm-hmm. I build on that?" You mm-hmm. think, oh, "Only 15 people like this." You know, you've, you're you've got your whole appreciation system backwards there. You need to uh, be grateful for those 15 people and then figure out, well, how how can I keep them coming back and what can I give them that will help them tell another 15 and another 15? And right. that's how you start to grow. You don't just someday wake up and decide you're going to have 100,000 followers and that they all owe you something. And it's a really weird entitlement thing that happens, I think, with a lot of brand new media properties out there where you're blinded by the expectation of success you get frustrated early and you, t- uh, you throw in the towel before doing all the work it takes to actually get noticed. Mm-hmm. It's amazing what happens when you gain 10 followers uh, to a property you're working on just because you interacted a little bit more that week. You know, that, and, and, and think of what that does for you, like how it motivates you. Right, you know? right. Exactly. Um, and and, and I, I think there's a really good context for this. This is, I mean, I, I, I've, I've seen that because I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, geez, I only got... A hundred people downloaded this or something like that over the years, right? And uh, and and it's like, but a hundred people for me, I go back to uh, as you know, I used to have a little bit of a music group, and I keep mm-hmm. looking at the numbers and I say, what if those people were in that little you know concert hall that I used to play in? I would have been ecstatic, right? Yep. Uh, Think up if you subscribe to that really cool service uh, at thinkup.com that kind of breaks down your Twitter and social media stats and kind of puts them into this is what this means. Uh, that I use, they, they take, uh, oh, you have this many followers. This would fill Radio City Music Hall. Or, hey, the Rolling Stones only had 17 people out there for a show. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, just a really cool context to kind of, like, put a physicality to these digits that we clock up, you know. Uh, you have five hits on your video. Five people watched your video, you know, that you made and put your your, your stuff into, you know. Uh, try to get feedback from them, for instance. Yeah. So, certainly. Okay. 
and I think the other point that, that's worth mentioning here too is there's a long tail to the success of most of these properties that pays off when you truly love the experience of producing. Uh, if you're doing it just to get the reaction or you're doing it just to get followers or fans or whatever the metric is, uh, I, I don't want to get too like, pious about it, but I, I feel like there's a hollowness that happens when your whole goal is how can I get people to like me more and like me more and like me more under the presumption that once you hit this phantom number of fans or followers, you'll then have this weaponizable power to monetize them and make a living. Uh, I get that. I, you know, that's that's you know, sort of business 101 in a sense of, of growing your audience base or growing your customer base. But weirdly enough, I think most often the people who succeed in producing online media or really media of any kind are the ones who are successful because they love the act of learning how this media is made and they love the act of learning to do it better over time. Mm -hmm. And eventually the people who saw your stuff at first may not react to it. But if they notice you five months from now or a year from now, you're still at it and they see the improvement, they're impressed by it. They're far more likely to take you seriously at that point. And that is when you really start to build an audience because you've gotten consistently better at it. And I, I point to things like um, Broad City, which started out as two comedians putting on a, a show on YouTube that uh, I think barely 100,000 people ever watched. But one of those people was Amy Poehler, and she's the one who got the Broad City Girls the deal at Comedy Central. So it can be done, but you have to be really good. You have to stand out, you have to have your own voice, and you have to really be solidly serving a niche of people who are reliably coming to you increasingly on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be hundreds of thousands or millions, but you have to know that what you're doing is resonating with people because it's authentic. And if it's just out there to make money, uh, you, you're preemptively just a brand at that point. And it's not fulfilling to you and it's not fulfilling to your audience. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, everybody, I know everybody gets mired in the technology of, uh, well, what camera are you using? What microphone are you using? You know, which mm -hmm. is great when you've been doing it for a while. But um, I mean, like I'm looking at some of this Broad City stuff. I I've looked at it before uh, when I heard about the background. And it's very, you know, it's not, it it's not, refined you know <laughs> but there was something going on there and and it, and, it, and it hit and now they have a budget at least you know somewhat of a comedy central budget to do something with you know um and the, the unrefinedness i think is part of the charm too mm -hmm. like you get so used to looking at the over slicked productions from hollywood or from mainstream television that uh, clearly there's, a, there's an aesthetic difference with youtube and I think most of us expect it to be, you know, cats on skateboards. And we've been saying this for 10 years, right? This guy's getting hit in the balls and cats on skateboards. It's all YouTube ever is. But there's also a certain level of authenticity in this media because it's the people with the handheld cameras or shooting their, their movies on their iPhones mm -hmm. that are telling the stories that nobody else wants to pay for. So it's like if you're willing to suffer through a little bit of shaky video and questionable audio, that's when you hear people making statements and having points of view you're not going to hear anywhere else. And now you get passionate about that because you're like, you know what? Those Broad City Girls are saying exactly what I've been thinking. And it took, you know, someone with a handheld camera to do it, but it resonated with me. It was amazing that I actually found a cat on a skateboard video while you were talking about that. It's probably not that amazing, honestly. I actually, it is pretty like, damn amazing. Look at this thing. Look at that guy go. There you go. We missed, I missed the boat. I missed the boat on the cats. Apparently, hell, I'm just getting on the gift bandwagon personally. So uh, I apologize to everybody I've been texting lately. Uh, there's, but, there's so many memes in so little time. You know? I know, I know. There's only so much. There's only so much. Uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around Snapchat. But anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, for, I had a good point on that uh, that I, I forgot because there's a cat on a skateboard right now on my screen over here, and that's just it derails every it thought. Just, you should never show this in Congress. We'd get nothing done. No, we would absolutely get nothing done. Uh, but anyways, uh, <laughs> back to Buck Yip. So it's year 10. How are you feeling about year 10? It is year 10, which we need to point out. It's the 10th one, not the 10th anniversary. That would be next year. So this is the 10th one. <laughs> okay. Just like with the Super Bowl. The 50th is not the 50th anniversary because the first one was numbered anyway. It's long story. That broke me when so. I was trying to figure out my podcast. I was like, wait a minute. This is the 10th year. Uh, but it's not yeah. the 10th. But wait. But it's the 10th year. Did I miss something? Did I add it up wrong? And it just like completely broke me for like a week trying to figure out if I missed our the biggest anniversary. But uh, there you go. Uh, but, you know, uh, still, 
It's the tenth one we've done. We're in the no, double digits huge. now. We're, no one else is in double digits. Yeah, we can take that one with us. So <laughs> I, I feel pretty good about that. It's a nice book. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting because we're going to be talking at this podcast about where digital media has been, where it was ten years ago, uh, or well, sorry, nine years ago, uh, and how it has changed and evolved since, and where we think it's going to go. You know, uh, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, you and I are going to be part of a panel that's going to be talking about exactly that topic. Right. Uh, you know, we, the the original gangsters of uh, Pittsburgh podcasting, if you will, uh, looking forward a few years from now and trying to figure out where it's going to go. Because we were all saying nine years ago, at some point, you know, you're already in competition right now online in 2006 with everybody else who's producing digital media. And it's not that many. But as we quickly noticed, the NBCs and CBSs and CNNs of the world got in that game pretty quickly. And all of a sudden, you who's making this podcast on your phone or who's recording audio in your basement is now up against Comedy Central and everybody else who can actually put real money behind it. Mm -hmm. And it became that whole compression of the box that we were talking about. We've reached the point now where it doesn't matter what you're watching something on. Your TV is your computer, is your phone. And we knew this was going to happen. And it took us a while to come to terms with it. It took brands a while to come to terms with what that would mean. And it took advertisers a while. So I think we're still figuring that part out. And I'm mm-hmm. curious to see what everybody else will be predicting uh, 10 years from now. But start thinking about that. So we're going to, I think, have some revelations and some bold prognostications at uh, Podcast Pittsburgh 10. Mm-hmm. I, I, I remember, uh, I, I think I'm remembering this correctly, but I think it was on the sh- on the set of Bar- Barista's where you walked in one night and you're like, uh, our mutual friend, uh, uh, Mr. Carmen, ha- you, you, you witnessed his Roku box, I believe, and that he was watching YouTube on his television or, so- or something to that effect. And, and, yeah, was, and yeah. now... It was 2011. 2011, yeah. and now it's just like, that's just how do it now you know yeah. it, it, how's become- now it's like who imagine not watching youtube on your tv you're like what kind of sad pathetic experience would that be right it's just a presumption <laughs> you know? it's like what this tv doesn't come with youtube what's wrong with it you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but uh, it, yeah but, the, but that creates so much competition for attention mm-hmm. that you even as an independent producer now have to keep stepping up your game constantly mm-hmm. like it's not enough to just make the media and get it out there i mean this hasn't been the case for a while Mm-hmm. You you need to be at a point where you're thinking competitively with everybody else who's also producing media if you want to get yours seen. You know, I, the buzz feeds of the world are very good at monopolizing the time of the viewers and the listeners and the readers that you would want. So that is who you, as an audio, as a uh, production company of one, or two, or five, are in direct competition with. And the weird thing is, you can still win, but the odds are certainly not stacked in your favor. Certainly, certainly. Uh, you know, actually, recently, they, you know, there was a social media day happened, and for the second year, uh, they had a great uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, number of speakers down here at uh, Smith Brothers at Left Field Studio or, or Left Field Meeting Space, actually. And uh, Jenny uh, Pickerel, uh, of course, that's Church.net, uh, was talking about her uh, contest with the Lemieux Foundation. They're getting, you know, raising, uh, trying to raise ten thousand dollars every year uh, to get video, new video games in for sick kids at the Children's Hospital. Yeah. And uh, she was talking about how hard, how much harder it is to do that every year now, even to the point where this year she was trying to raise money and the blue dress thing happened on on the mm-hmm. Internet. And it was just it, it, it's just getting tougher and tougher every year. Even somebody who's, you know, a prolific blogger like her has a tremendous audience. But there's just so many people because everybody figured out, oh, we can do it, too. And there's so many that are ele- elevating. And uh, it, it just seems like uh, the audience is getting spread even thinner. It is. I mean, the the good news is I think the audience as a whole is going to keep getting larger. You know, I mean, there's always more people who are getting Internet access. And mm-hmm. A lot of them are uh, not necessarily in the U.S. and a lot of them are not necessarily English speakers. So the other part of this whole audience uh, attention argument is a lot of folks are going to be producing media for those other audiences. And so now they, they have advertising dollars behind themselves as well. So if you're fighting for just your U.S. English-speaking audience, that's already going to be one uphill battle. Now if you want global awareness, that's a different battle. But even if you're a pit girl who has been producing you know, quality blog material for the past 10 years, 
even she has to keep upping her game to keep expanding her audience. Mm -hmm. Because the people who've known her for a while, now they're used to it. And the new people who come along, they would not necessarily look at her and just think, oh, you've been blogging for 10 years and therefore I should automatically like and trust you. They look at her and they think, well, how, you know, who are you compared to, quite honestly, to a Kardashian, you know? Why ought I to pay attention to Pit Girl instead of Kim Kardashian? So this is the argument for, uh, or the battle for attention that we're all in. Certainly. It's, it's so funny because I just did another podcast talking about our, everybody's obsession with Kim Kardashian and selfies today. Uh, so we've completely gone full circle in my recording I'm not day. against selfies. I have no problem with selfies. <laughs> I, I think the problem I would have is when your own narcissism grows to the point where you can't have empathy for other human beings. That would mm-hmm. be a concern. But if you just want to take a picture of yourself and put it online, go ahead. But, uh, you, only, you only live once. Share that. I, I, I do the selfies. I do, but it's always like, check out the cool set behind me. You know, <laughs> I'm actually so here. You're, you're inventing a reason to feel good about it. Yes, yes. It's like, this is this is my, hey, look at this. Usually it's a, it's a camera selfie of sorts because I always get the camera in the shot because I always okay. like that POV kind of shot going on. But anyways, lately. It depends on what's, you know, what's there was an interesting uh, point made recently about, I forget, it was one of the, uh, like the founding fathers of the internet, and I apologize for not calling the gentleman's uh, name. Vince Cerf? But he was talk- Pardon? Uh, Vin- Vincent Cerf? It may have been, if we're talking about the same thing. Uh, Maybe. The, the fact that this generation is not going to have any physical photographs, and if there's ever a massive cloud or data crash, there's going to be an entire generation of identity and history lost. All your baby pictures, all your growing up, all your family reunions, all your videos. Nobody really has like printouts of these anymore to put mm-hmm. in frames and put on the mantle. So it's like, where does all of this go if the services we're entrusting them to fold? Right, exactly. And and, and to me, it's redundancies, it seems. <laughs> I know I, for mm-hmm. one, have photos in every cloud that I can stick it in, uh, your Facebook, Google, and your iCloud at this point. And I'm just like, well... I can always get it from somewhere, right? But we, we're only about, what, five years into that part of the experiment. Um, yep. but yeah. Or wait I, until your next hard drive corrupts or something, and you're like, oh, there goes a year's worth of something. Exactly, right? or music, or, you know, you went and did the iTunes match, and it wrongly replaced half of your music that you've been collecting for how many years? And you decided to uh, uh, sell all your CDs back to the uh, the local uh, exchange store because, uh, you, well, I have them all digitally. Well, like, good, I hope you have backups of that because <laughs> you just sold your other backup. Um, but uh, you, you almost, at the end of the year, you want to give yourself, like, the to-do of between Christmas and New Year's, print out as many of the valid photographs you took from this year as possible. Just, right. uh, just, just in case, just in case. But also the case that, like, how many, how many people are, you know, we're, we're also at that point where the kids coming up don't know what a physical photo looks, feels like. You know, they're they're just used to always having this and it works. They're not from the good old days like us, Justin, where we had to boot up a computer. It just showed text. And uh, maybe we booted into Windows 3.1. Maybe I'm dating myself a little too new here. Uh, or And you're in your green, black and green Oregon Trail game and, yeah. and, and you know, Command C and, and not Command C or uh, uh, C colon slash DIR. You know, uh, it's just it's just uh, uh, listen to Nirvana and I have it. Whoever those guys were, they're so old. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, uh, to bring this conversation back almost full circle to the whole podcast experience, uh, I had an intern uh, last summer at my day job, and uh, one of the she was twenty one, I think. Okay. And I asked her at one point uh, what TV shows she watches, and she's like, "Oh, I don't watch any. I watch YouTube." And I said, "Oh, so what? So you don't watch TV? You just watch television shows on YouTube?" And she's like, "No, I don't." I don't watch any shows that are on television. All I watch are video bloggers on YouTube. That's it. That's how I get my news. That's how I get my entertainment. That's where everything comes from. And she wow. could tell me in like minute detail what some of these video bloggers did and said what they were up to, you know, where he is and his crash diet and where she is and her this and that. And I was like, wow, like, yeah, I'm not that much older than you, but this seems like a whole new world and a whole new way to process that world. You know? mm-hmm. So I, I don't know, honestly, 10 years from now, much less 30, you know, how we're all going to be looking differently at media or what we're going to be looking at it on, or if we'll be looking at the same media. In, in a way, it's terrifying. In a way, it's exhilarating. In a way, I feel like we're losing something. So I guess I must have reached the age where my parents and grandparents were when I got on the internet and they were like, what the hell are you doing? 
<laughs> Indeed. Uh, that, that's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, I remember when I was uh, uh, teaching like um, the Let's Play videos, all the kids did when they had a break in between stuff, they were done with their work, they just watched people playing video games for the rest of the rest of the session i'm just and i was just like and i just sat back watching them watching people play video games because i'm just like this is for real this is happening you know Mm -hmm. and look at pewdiepie with uh seven million dollars and wb just started a uh video game channel (laughs) with one of their wrestlers it's it's absolutely Mm -hmm. it's absolutely crazy it's crazy well video gaming is is one of the only reliable uh money-making markets on youtube as far as i've seen you know the the fashion uh group the video game group i can't think of too much else that stands out as a guaranteed money maker but those are the two big ones right right exactly so what are you up to these days i noticed i saw a little new uh a uh, 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 twitter guy following me that you seem to be attached to there may be a few there uh, may be a few oh are you I'm talking about, about Freelance free- Rush was the one that I yes, got attention yes, to. Yes, exactly. I, I feel like I have a number of things in stealth. I never know which one someone knows about. But oh, we'll okay. talk about Freelance Rush. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been freelancing. Uh, I went full-time in 2005 and uh, with a, a brief three years in which I had a day job between then and now. Mm-hmm. I've been freelancing the whole time. Uh, and I was freelancing for a few years before that. So basically, it's been more than a decade where I have been finding a way to make a living uh, with what amounts to a side job. Uh, and we finally reached the point now in that career of mine where people are asking me, well, how can I get started freelancing or how can I get better at freelancing? And it's been people from a pretty wide variety of backgrounds, from uh, nutritionists to PR people to designers to photographers. So I said, you know what? There's something here. So Freelance Rush is a freelance coaching service in which, uh, I mean, there's free information that I can give away happily to anybody who wants it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there is personalized service that I can give to the folks who actually want to improve their process of building their freelance business. So uh, no matter what your background is and no matter what your skill set is, in my opinion, it usually comes down to uh, how reliable and effective is your workflow and your process at growing your business reliably. So I, the other thing I'll say about it, too, is I kind of hate online coaching in the sense that it always feels like it's some skeevy guy in a blazer trying to sell me common sense. And it feels really like snake oil-ish in a way, and I like subconsciously reject most of it. Mm-hmm. So I'm consciously trying to not do that here. Uh, I, I feel like I actually have legitimate expertise that I can share, and I feel like there, there's a certain level of honesty and bluntness I can bring to a conversation where I feel no problems telling someone – this isn't going to work for you, and this is going to work for you. And uh, if I need to be the bad cop that keeps you in line on the path towards your dreams, I'm happy to do that for you. Uh, but I just I enjoy helping people find a way out of the trap they feel like they're in. Because so many times people say to me, "Well, I would love to start it, but you know, I don't have the time, or I don't have the money, or I don't know this, or I don't have this network." And like they invent these magic blockades for themselves. Like, mm-hmm. well, someday in this magic time known as someday, yeah. I'm going to try and write that novel or I'm going to try and create this, you know, uh, T-shirt business or something. And I'm like, how about tomorrow? And how about you take these steps and let's make a plan. And let's stick to it. And it's amazing how just, you know, it takes a couple of weeks to create a habit. And then all of a sudden they're off and running. So. And that's interesting because I was curious to see your take on this because I know I've been kind of pitched recently. Oh, you need to do an ebook and do a podcast around an ebook, and that's how you make money from podcasting. And those always feel super weird to me. And again, kind of like the you know feel very snakeoily to me, right? You know, um, especially the business ones. And uh, they can, yeah, they can. I mean, yeah. I, I think there's a le- I don't want to say legitimate as though the others aren't legitimate, but I think it comes down to the tone, right? And it comes down to how you feel about positioning yourself. It's yeah. actually something that I teach people in uh, Freelance Rush, too, is, you know, you can't be everything to everybody. So you have to figure out what do you feel comfortable selling yourself as. Right. And you have to feel comfortable doing that to a certain group of people because you can't you can't have the same message for everyone. Right. But I feel like if, you know, there are people out there that you or I might look at and go, mm, I'm not buying what that guy's selling. Mm-hmm. But he's talked himself into it and he believes it. And I'm going to guess that people are believing him, too. You know, there's there's somebody out there who will respond to any message, no matter how it's crafted. So I worry less about that than I do with crafting it in a way that I feel good about, 
and helping you craft it therefore in a way that you feel good about. But like you had said, you know, create an ebook and then do a podcast and you, you give one away for free to monetize the other. I mean, it works is the thing. And there's mm-hmm. a reason why it's advised to do it like that is because there's a proven success template for that. It doesn't mean that you have to do it. It doesn't mean that uh, there, you know, another way is better or wrong. So it's just sort of a matter of, can I make this work for me without making it feel like I'm not myself? Right, right, right. If, if it fits into your personal purview, right? So, but you know, yeah. hey, for, you know, freelancing in general. I, I know this is going to turn into our old podcast. We did a podcast briefly uh, called "Freelance for Real," which I love. Actually, um, uh, uh, a colleague, uh, a younger graphic designer, actually went back and listened to a bunch of them uh, several months ago. He was telling me <laughs> as he was uh, venturing out. So it, it's people are st- still finding this, the thing, and I'm curious to look at the stats and see how many people maybe still are. We had we, we had great conversations back then because that's when I first broke out. Mm-hmm on my own and i was just like yeah. help me with my misconceptions <laughs> so right that's it it's almost like fear of the unknown it, you know? it like is you, it is you know you know what you can do mm-hmm. you don't yet know what you don't know and you don't yet know what you can't do and now i feel like donald Rumsfeld, but uh you need to <laughs> be less afraid of those unknowns so mm-hmm. you can uh fail faster if need be learn from it faster and get back on your feet without feeling like oh this defines me Right. Oh, I made this mistake, and you know what? I made one mistake, and now I'm done with it. And so, you know what? You're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to screw up a lot of things. You might burn some bridges. Here's how you can avoid doing a lot of that. But the truth is, you just need to sort of suck it up and learn from it and help it, and let it help you become better at what you're doing, rather than thinking you must always be perfect and never make a wrong step, because you're never going to get anything done that way. Right. It, it's scary not having the boss uh, safety net, but now we turn into a, yet another podcast at this point, so we'll move back around. <laughs> Anything else going on you want to talk about? Uh, maybe, I know you are you got your hands in a lot of things, being a freelancer, of course. I do, I do, but I actually think that you gave us the perfect way to bring this back to Bodcamp and wrap things up. Mm-hmm. You had said it's, uh, you know, it, it's almost a relief sometimes to have the boss or the manager just looking over your shoulder, because if you are your own boss... It's sort of like, well, if I let myself down, nobody else suffers sort of a thing. So it's easy to let yourself backslide sometimes, right? And I feel like when you're creating a podcast, when you're creating audio or video or blogging or anything for the net, the first thing that you think of is, well, I'm in charge of this. And I have my audience. They expect something from me, right? But there's nobody telling me I have to get it done. There's nobody making me get it done. Unless you have a sponsor who's like, you need to get your shit out now. Uh it's up to you to sort of stick to your own prescribed schedule. If you say you're going to put up a new episode on Mondays and Thursdays, no one else is going to make you do it but you. If you say you're going to do something on a daily or a weekly basis, it's literally up to you. So if you don't create that work ethic, and if you don't honestly love the production, like I was talking about earlier, and all you're doing is waiting for the feedback to give you the reason to keep going, you might hit a trough of two or three episodes or weeks where you don't get the feedback you wanted, and then you're like, well, I give up. So just like freelance, when you're producing independent media, you need to find a way to keep yourself motivated and interested and make yourself a better employee by being a better boss to you. Thank you. I think that's a perfect point to end it on. So Justin okay. Kanaki, he'll be at PodCamp Pittsburgh X. What am I, we going to do a hand sign? Yeah, yeah, right there, right there. That's, what, that's how we're going to introduce it. Welcome to PodCamp X. We should look this up and make sure that's not an offensive gesture to a group of people we're not thinking about right now. We are streaming live, <laughs> I believe, to that one um, and this show as well. Uh, but, of course, you're at, at Justin Kanaki on the Twitters, JustinKanaki.com, uh, FreelanceRush.com, and, uh, and go, to, go check out a great blog, great blog. Hey, hey, I enjoyed your article about the uh, Twitter uh, shutting down your advertising. <laughs> Yeah, just when you think you know how the internet works, you keep realizing there's things you don't know, and it doesn't work the way it should or the way you thought it should. So mm-hmm. there's always something new to learn, which is why you should come to PodCamp and learn the things you don't know. Awesome. Yeah, and I believe you are officially the keynoter of PodCamp at this point, right? Somehow that happened, yes. yes. So I will be talking for a bit, and then we'll be paneling for a bit, and then we'll all be on our own to peer educate one another while eating free food. Fantastic. I don't even know how many sessions I've been attached to so far 
And I think I'm still doing a little bit of the video streaming. So we'll see how that works out this year. Go to podcamppittsburgh.com, register now, and uh, and it's, it's free. It's free. If you can get to Pittsburgh on August 15th and 16th, there's no reason not to. If not, please follow us online. Like I said, we're going to be streaming the sessions uh, as best as we can. I think we're going to have some professional help this year, actually, for at least the main room. So very excited that that's going to be going down. And um, there, you, don't, you don't even know. There's, 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 there's Justin's returning to PodCamp. There's some uh, uh, names floating about of some other uh, uh, old school people coming back to PodCamp that, uh, that that you'll be excited to see. And, uh, and and you never know who's going to show up. And you never know who's going to be the next uh, uh, Pittsburgh dad or I just teen or something. You, you got something there? Sure. I was going to say. But the other thing to keep in mind, too, and you're right about all this, but no matter who else shows up, the awesome thing is whoever does show up, that's the community. And that's what you end up building with. And those are the people that you don't know today. Could be a guy on Twitter who's got 40 followers and he becomes your best friend. Literally, this is how PodCamp works. It's how it's worked for nine years. That's how it's going to work again this year. You come, you meet, you share, you learn, and you form this new bond. And it's really awesome. Everybody I hang out with, like this week, I more or less met from PodCamp. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic, or the internet at large. It works, guys, and it could work for you, too. Uh, thanks. Go check out everything out. Like I said, podcamppittsburgh.com, justinkanaki.com. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so uh, check out everything. Again, awesomecast.net. Subscribe. Check out the other interviews. We got a great line of interviews with all kinds of awesome people in Pittsburgh and beyond, talking technology, talking blogging, talking music, as we did last week with Arnie Roth of the great Final Fantasy uh, uh, Symphony Ensemble coming up in Pittsburgh here on August 1st. Uh, so thank you. Just has been my awesome guest this week. You've been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.